Uh, good day. Hey, this is Dr. Bob Stark again for uh, Computer Science 1302, talking today about exception handling. Um, last class, you you, uh, you talked about version control with um, with Git. Um, you talked about concepts like local versus repo remote repositories. Um, you looked at um, the fundamental operations of add, commit, push, and pull, as well as clone. Um, and at the bottom here are some steps that you should use when um, uh, you're, you're dealing with Git specifically for, for how we do things in this course. Um, and feel free to, to ask me or, or your instructor about this um, as needed. But I'll jump over that to keep this, uh, keep this video shorter. All right, a little review from Computer Science 1. We talked about exceptions there. Mainly, we looked at um, a legal argument exception and how to enforce preconditions with it. So, for example, we had something like, if name equals null, throw new a legal argument exception. And we may have had a little message in there to, to go along with the exception. Um, we used uh, a legal argument exception to enforce our preconditions. Um, and it's one of many examples of, of exceptions that we can use in Java. Uh, we also learned how to use assert throws from JUnit 5 to check that uh, an illegal argument exception was properly thrown in a unit test. Say so, we have a setup like, oops, I meant to highlight, not move. We had a setup like this where we have assert throws and the first argument is the type of exception we expect. The second is parentheses, arrow, and the code we expect to throw that, that uh, exception. And of course, if the code does not throw the exception, then the assert throws is going to fail and our test is going to fail. All right, today we're going to look to build on this, these ideas and uh, learn how to handle exceptions that have been thrown um, in ways other than simply making the program crash. We call this exception handling. So more generally, an exception is, is some sort of event um, that occurs while our program is running um, that disrupts the normal execution flow. Certainly a legal argument exception um, falls into that, that scenario. Um, some are beyond the control of the programmer. Um, and the, the classic examples here are we try to open a file and it doesn't exist. Or we try to open a file and the, or we try to open a new file and the disk says we can't do that, we're out of storage. Um, these are things we can't handle uh, ourselves. We can't anticipate these problems uh, beyond having an exception handler that, that deals with them when they occur. Uh, other types of exceptions uh, can be avoided by the programmer. A legal argument exception is one of those. Another is the null program exception, or the, sorry, the null pointer exception. So if we take a look at this little snippet of code, if name dot is empty or name equals null, this is actually buggy. If name were, you know, we're probably using this to try to throw in a legal argument exception, but we're checking name dot is empty first. If name is already null and we try to do dot is empty on it, we're going to get null pointer exception before we ever check for the null case. Uh, in my CS1 classes, I encourage students to avoid this style and to actually do two separate um, if statements, uh, with two separate uh, illegal argument exception throws. And we always do the null check first. All right, so let's let's take a look at um, an exception being thrown in, in, in the wild. So we, you should have uh, this uh, exception handling sandbox project available in um, on, on Moodle. Uh, if you want to pull that up and, and follow along at home, you're, you're certainly encouraged to do so. Um, I'm going to run my program. And all this does is um, it lets me enter a name, I'll use mine, and enter a grade. And I didn't do so well, so I made a 40. And it works fine. Both of those are valid values, um, and we're, we're done. So it's just uh, it's checking to see if they were valid. They were. We're great. Let's run it again. 
and let's not put in a proper name. I just hit enter, so it's either going to be null or empty. I'm not, not sure which. And let's put in a valid grade. And we get an exception. In this case, it's an illegal argument exception. Name cannot be empty. And one of the things we get is what's called a stack trace. Each of these ats tells me some point in the code that um, is involved in, in the scenario. If we go all the way to the bottom, we see the main method, which is here, which is what started everything off. It called my, my run uh, in the demo, and the demo did some, there it is. There's the run that it called. There's the reading input method that run called, and it was, um, and then that called the constructor, that's what init means for, for student. And that shows you where the actual um, illegal argument exception was thrown. Because we are not doing anything to handle that exception, that exception gets passed from the constructor up to the method that called the constructor, up to the method that called that one, up to main method itself. Um, nothing, nothing is handling it, so it propagates all the way to the top of the, the call stack. Um, and in this case, main just crashes the program because it doesn't know what to do with it. And that's what we've been doing with these things so far. Uh, let's run it again. Let's see what happens when we put uh, an invalid value in it. Um, let's just type in Joe as a grade. Doesn't like that. Gives us a number format exception. And again, we see some... Um, some backtracing of where these things uh, occurred. Um, if you want to see specifically, let's go here. We tried to do an integer.parsent on a string, but that string didn't look like a number. So it, it, it failed, and again, it passed that exception all the way up to the top and crashed our program. So just to wrap up here, program crashes with the stall uh, the call stack being printed out. Um, better ideas, let's, let's try to anticipate and handle these things. So let's do one. Well, actually, let's talk about exception handling first, and then I'll show how we can integrate that. So when we talk about exception handling, we are referring to special code or special problem processing that deals with those exceptions. And we, um, so instead of crashing, we actually, you know, handle it without crashing and take action that recovers from the exception um, within our program. Uh, why do we need to do, to do this? Well, it makes our programs more robust and user friendly. Uh, we're looking to tolerate faults like files not missing or network. Uh, resources not being available, or simply a user typing something in incorrectly. Uh, we shouldn't crash in those situations. We should recover from them and uh, try to give the user another chance to, uh, to keep going. Um, so some guidelines for dealing with them. Um, these are really not the use of if statements. So in the past, before we had um, proper exception handling code, we just had to use if statements. And you will see code in the wild that are using um, ifs and um, return error return codes and things like that to, to indicate, to, to deal with exceptions. And we're trying to avoid that uh, now that we have some better tools um, at our disposal. Um, exceptions should not be used to handle problems that do not, that do not occur frequently. Oh, sorry, it should be used to handle infrequent problems. So if it's something that happens in the normal uh, usage of your program, you should not be using exceptions to deal with that. Um, and these are programming language tools um, that and mechanisms that help us provide consistency and clarity in handling these errors. So some exceptions we will see in Java. Um, if you, if you try to access an array list index that doesn't exist, we get an index out of bounds exception. Uh, call a method on a null object, null pointer exception. You've probably seen this one. Uh, divide by zero gives us an arithmetic exception. 
Um, if we try to access a file that doesn't exist, file not found exception, number format exception you just saw, um, a legal argument exception you've seen before. Uh, let's check, fix my spelling there. Um, and if you're like looking for something in an empty collection, you might get something like a no such element exception. So these are all examples. There's hundreds probably in the Java API, and eventually you'll, you'll you can learn to make your own. Although that's out of scope for today. So when these ex exceptions occur, um, Java creates an exception object, um, and this object holds some information about the problem. Um, and then we can do one of two things with the exception. We can catch it and deal with it immediately, or we can propagate it to the caller, meaning we pass it up to the method that calls the method we're, we're currently doing. We handle the exception with something called a catch. Um, if we're going to propagate it, it is thrown to its caller. And we'll look at each of these things in turn. So some terminology here. Try is a block of code that may generate an exception. Throw is what we mean when an exception uh, occurs. And we can throw these um, manually or they can be thrown by code that we call. Um, and catch is a block of code that um, deals with the exception. So here's kind of the format of a try catch block. We have a try followed by um, uh, curly braces for a block of code. And we put code inside the try that we think might throw an exception. And Java is actually pretty good about telling us, or sorry, Eclipse is also is very good about telling us sometimes. If it knows about uh, an exception, it will force us to use a try block or a, a throws clause, which we'll see later. Um, so something in this code might throw an exception. In this case, um, we're looking at a legal argument exception which might be thrown by the, the student constructor. Then we have a catch, and catch takes a parameter, and the parameter is the type of exception with a variable, and usually we use E for the variable. And catch is also a block, and that's the code that we do if something fails in here. So in other words, if the code in this try block generates an illegal ex argument exception, we immediately jump into the catch block and execute the code there, and then move on. So let's see if we can integrate this into our um, demo here. a little different from the demo. So let's just put a try here. Let's just try to catch that illegal argument exception that might be produced by creating a new student. Uh, I don't have a display pop-up method, so I will just do a system.out print line parameter to student constructor. So I don't think we're able to tell which one's gonna do it. Actually let's just do do this. Let's see what happens. Okay, so now I, to, to demonstrate how this works, I'm going to um, do a correct grade, sorry, a correct name and an invalid grade, and let's and, um, catch that error. So let's put in a proper name. Let's put in a grade that is outside of our valid range. And there we go. So instead of uh, failing, I get an error. Grade must be between 0 and 100. 
Now I can still fail on my uh, on a bad name. Oh, actually, we can't. So then it pa passes the empty name in there. So we can. Um, I, I forgot that it's. Um, yeah, yeah. So we, we tried to pass in an empty gr empty name, and uh, we also got an error for that. So it, it's still checking us. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind here is when an exception occurs, um, all code uh, after it is skipped until we find an exception handler, whether that's a catch block or a throws clause, as, as we see, see later. Um, if we don't find an exception handler in, in the local method or in the local scope, um, it will actually pause, it will actually finish um, executing that method and check in the method that called it. If the method that called it doesn't have a handler, it'll pass it up to the next um, method that called it and so forth um, until um, you know it finds a handler or until um, it reaches the Java virtual machine, in which case it'll it'll crash. So here's, here, here's an example. So we have a try and a catch. We have lines A, B, C, M, I, and J. So we try, execute line A, we execute line B, and this throws an exception. If that happens, we will not execute line C. We will immediately jump to the catch, and that will execute line M, and then we'll move on to what happens after the exception. So in this code, line C never gets executed. We, we skip it over entirely. As soon as a um, exception is thrown, we pause execution there and start looking for catch blocks. So things we can do in the catch blocks. We can uh, log the exception in a file. Um, we can also provide some information to guide the user. Maybe simply tell them, hey, you typed your date in in an incorrect format. Try again, please. Um, you know, we can uh, tell them other things about the error, you know, whatever. Um, there's several things we've got, got available. There's a git message that will help us out here. Um, git message basically tells you which you passed in as the, the message to an exception. Let's see if I can find that again. Uh, print stack trace gives you, um, let's see if we can force a stack trace here. That's a stack trace. And you can print that out inside your um, inside your own programs if you wish. Uh, we've seen an example of doing this. So if we have if we catch an exception, um, we can call, for example, it's dot message um, method there. And note we did that in our um, our example here. We can have multiple catch blocks, and we can use these to um, catch different kinds of exceptions that might be generated by a piece of code. Um, and we, we do this by um, having a separate catch block for each exception type um, from the most specific first to the more general. And we'll see what that means uh, when we talk about exception later in the semester. Um, the first block that, that catches the type of exception is run, um, and the others are ignored. Uh, so per, uh, things will continue after that. And here's kind of how it looks. We have a try, some code that may throw an exception. Our first catch looks just like before. We have an exception class followed by its parameter. So here's the code that, ha that handles that specific kind of exception can have another catch that handles a different exception class, and here's the code that can handle that type of kind of uh, exception parameter. We can have as many of these catches as we like. In practice, you might see more, no more than two or three. Um, but the main thing to remember is only one of these catches is going to be executed at most. So if we catch here, we're going to skip 
that catch and continue with the rest of the code. Um, here's another example of, of, of how to do that. We have a try, lines A, B, and C. Um, this one is catching number format exception, which as it turns out is a more specific version of a legal argument exception. Um, it could also catch an arithmetic exception as well, but um, that, that doesn't, doesn't really fall in the specificity range. Um, so if we were to catch a number format exception, we're going to skip these two over. If you want to catch any general exception, you can use this type. So um, in this uh, setup, we can catch number format exceptions specifically. We can catch arithmetic exceptions specifically. And this will catch any other kind of exception out there. Um, again, when we talk about inheritance, we will um, th this will become more clear. Um, but this is kind of the general, again, the general catch-all for, for all exceptions. So um, if you put that at the end, um, you're going to have code that will handle any other kind of exception that might have been generated. Um, how do I know what exceptions may be thrown? Um, send it in the documentation. Um, so let's take a look at array list real quick. Uh, if I can do that without... There we go. Pull this in here. So let's uh, check for something that might throw an exception. So here's the documentation for the get method. Um, it's get followed by an index. We see parameters like we expect. We see a returns like we expect. And now we have this thing throws. This is telling it, us it will throw an index out of bounds exception if the index is out of range. See if we've got something else that might might throw. Let's check remove. It probably remove will also throw an index out of bounds um, if it's out of range. Here's a remove that removes an object. It doesn't doesn't do anything. Uh, add all isn't a good one. So add all will add everything in a particular collection to the list it will throw null pointer exception if the collection we pass to it is null. So you, you can always look in the API to find out what exceptions things will, will, um, will throw. Finally block. Um, if you have a try and catch, you can attach a finally block onto the end. And, and the idea behind a finally is that it will always be executed. Um, even if, um, even if the, the exception is thrown, the finally will, will always be called after the, the catch block ha has finished doing its thing. Um, not used a whole lot, but um, we can use it to, to close resources, as we'll, we'll see in a minute. In fact, let me see if I can do this now. I'm going to move my try here. It gave me a. So I'm going to try all of this stuff. Okay, so I'm going to do a try block around all of this stuff. And I'm going to do a catch here for. Um, let's see, what we can get. A, a number format ex exception. So let's do that one. And we'll do a so. 
that will catch the number format exception that might get generated by the parse int. We'll also catch a legal argument exception. We'll do the same thing. We'll print out the message. That will catch the illegal arguments um, that could be generated by um, the student constructor. Then we're going to do a finally block to make sure we close the scanner. And I need to move that outside there. So as you'll see later, a scanner is a way we can um, read data from a file, or in this case, the keyboard. Close the block somewhere. Hmm, okay. Oh, I see what happened. I was treating that as the end of method. There we go. So this ensures that no matter what happens in here, my input, my scanner gets closed when I'm done. If I had left it there and say my parse int through a number format exception, I would skip over all this, uh, this code, handle my number format exception, and I would never uh, be nice and tidy and close my scanner. Um, I don't think it's so much of a problem with a scanner, but um, if this were an actual file, that would be a problem. We would want to make sure it gets closed. So just by way of, of being good, we'll put that there. Uh, here's an example format with finally. Um, actually, we've, we've, we just did that in, in our, our, um, our demo, so I'm going to move past that in the interest of time. Uh, how do we propagate exceptions? Uh, if we don't uh, catch it with a, with a catch block, um, we actually pass it on up or propagate it to whoever called us. And we've seen that before with the, the, call, with the call chain. Um, some exceptions may be thrown by the Java virtual machine um, when uh, certain kinds of exceptions occur. Uh, and if that's not called, uh, caught, it's thrown to the calling method. We can also throw um, exceptions as programmers as well. We do that with something called the throw um, keyword. Uh, one thing we may want to do with that is we catch an exception, but we may want to rethrow it to pass it on up to the caller. So here we have an arithmetic exception E. And remember, E is going to hold a uh, a reference to that exception object, we throw an exception object. And we've seen this before with throw new illegal argument exception. We created a new illegal argument exception. We used throw to, to throw that. All right, two types of exceptions, unchecked and checked. Uh, the unchecked are the ones we've, most of the ones we've seen before. Null pointer exception, illegal argument exception, number format, index out of bounds exception, arithmetic exceptions. Um, the compiler doesn't give us any information if these exist, meaning it's not checked by the compiler. You don't know if these exceptions um, will happen until you run the program. Um, there is no um, need by Java for um, the method for where the exception occurs to catch or rethrow um, that exception. Runtime exception is the the parent of all our unchecked exceptions. Um, so anything that inherits from it, as we'll see later, is is unchecked. Um, unchecked are generally the the ones that the programmer is expected to handle, um, in the sense that they are program errors. They are not user errors or um, environmental errors exter external to the program. There are things we should take care of and, and deal with internally, and they should never happen. If, if they happen in in, inside our program, we've, we've made a programming error. 
Um, oh, and here we go. They are the programmer's fault. Um, the compiler does not check whether you handle an unchecked exception or not. Um, we need to handle that um, ourselves. So these are things like null pointers. We should never have null pointers. Um, and so we should always write our code so they're not generated. But we should also write our code that um, with, with checks in there to make sure um, they don't happen. Check exceptions of the other kind. Um, these must be handled in our code. Uh, your program will not compile um, if you don't handle a check exception. And these indicate that something has gone wrong uh, for an external reason beyond our, per our control. Again, file not found. That's outside of a, of a programmer's control um, and that it must be dealt with by a check exception. So how do we handle it? We either catch it or throw it until it is caught. Um, if we want to throw it um, to the caller, we actually have to indicate that in the header by using a throws clause. Um, some exceptions here, IO exception, um, file not found exception, those are checked. So here we're going to handle a check exception with a try catch block. Um, so here's print out file and I think, nope, that's not there. We have scanner. We're going to try to open a file, and when we do so, that could, could potentially throw a file not, a file not found exception. So we're going to try that. Create our file, create a scanner, and we'll see how that works later. Uh, we're going to use our scanner to try to scan through our strings um, and, and, and grab something. This could generate a file not found exception, so we're going to have a catch block for that where we say, hey, our file is not found. So things we've seen before. This is a checked exception. If we did not have a try catch block here, we would probably get a, um, a syntax error somewhere right around there. Another way we can handle a check exception, um, instead of using our try catch block, we can say the method throws file not found exception. That tells the compiler that this method is not going to handle the exception, that whoever calls this method must have a, a try-catch block or further throw. Throws is used when a method does not catch a checked exception. Uh, so here's a throws example. Um, we have a main that throws IO exception, which is actually going to throw it to the, the JVM. Method 1 throws IO exception. Method 2 throws IO exception. Main calls method 1, method 1 calls method 2, method 2 generates a checked exception, uh, IO exception, it throws it to method 1, method th 1 doesn't handle it so it throws it to main, main actually doesn't handle it so it's going to pass it on to JVM. General guidelines, empty catch blocks are a no-no, um, it's very rare you do that. Um, but so if you have a catch block, you pretty much need to be doing something. Um, and if the method can't handle it, don't catch it. Throw it to the, the, to the caller. Um, recover from the error, error if you can. So if the user has entered something incorrectly, prompt them to enter it in the correct format. Um, you know, if you've queried a database and didn't get what you want, requery it. Or if you um, tried to, to open a file that didn't exist, um, let the user know, hey, this file doesn't exist. Type in the correct file name this time. Um, one more thing. Um, we've talked a lot about system.out uh, and print lining on that. Uh, this is what generally sends uh, text to the console. So we've seen this before. System.out.println, hello world. We also have something called system.air. Uh, this is a different output um, for printing error messages. And we can do it with system.error.println. Um, by default, Eclipse also sends this to the console. But as we'll see later, you can actually redirect it to a file or a different console or any other kind of, uh, of data sync. Um, but again, by default, these things go to the same place, but they don't have to. Um, and it's very common to take system.error and redirect it to a log file to ca capture those errors. All right, some 
additional resources here. You can click on those. Um, let's, before we go, let's see if we can do, um, we can try to open a file here. So in this demo, um, we're going to try to open a file um, named test.txt. Uh, we're going to try to create it. So I'm going to take those off. Actually, I'm going to show you something. Let's uh, import file. Now, right now, that has an unhandled exception type IO exception. I could type in the try catch block around it, but I'm going to go ahead and do a surround with try catch. And notice that stubbed everything out for me. I'm also going to move this in there too, just to kind of keep things tidy. All right. Notice it generated a, a catch block for me. I'm going to system.air.println um, message. Oops, I'm not doing it here. We're doing it in run. My bad. Ah, and we're already opening it here. All right, so let's run that. And, uh, and it ran fine. So we, we were successfully able to open our, our file um, and create it. Let's see if we can do this. There we go. So I um, tried to open a blank file, um, and it didn't allow, allow me to do that. So we, we caught an IO exception. Um, System.air print line uh, printed that message. Oh, and interestingly, it um, looks like the console prints uh, System.air stuff in red. So that's a good way to distinguish between um, System.air and System.out. Um, we could also, instead of catching this immediately, we could add a throws declaration. So now demo opening a file, throws IO exception. Um, and now we get our, uh, our error here. So we could surround that with a try catch. Run that. Once again, we we, we get our, our uh, error because we haven't um, we, we don't have a, a empty name empty file name uh, set up. But let's do the, let's do this once more. Even let's take the catch away from run and force run to also throw the IO exception up to main. And let's just go ahead and have main throw it as well. So we don't have a catch block at all. And it passes it all the way, because of this, it passes it to the JVM, which gives us our stack trace. All right, that's probably way too much for today. Uh, that's probably uh, going through all the code along. Please, 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 if, uh, if you have questions about this, let me or Dr. Yang know. Uh, we will be glad to help. Uh, 
and uh, as, as, as always. Um, and with that, I'll let you go for the day, and uh, we'll see you next time.